These following stories are taken from the latest series of my podcast, Deliver Us, which is available on Apple Podcasts and most other podcasting platforms. For those new to my channel, please don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy my storytelling and check out the podcast in the links in the channel description. Some of the people who allow me to share their stories sometimes have more than one, which leads me to believe there are those people who are more in tune than others when it comes to experiencing the paranormal. There are a number of theories that explain why some people are more likely to experience something paranormal than others. It could simply be down to the way someone's brain is wired, causing them to sense things that are not really there. Or maybe they really are gifted with the capacity to see something beyond our world. Welcome to Deliver Us. David White is a young man in his mid-twenties, who was born and raised in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Although visiting other parts of the United States during his work as a semi-truck driver, he never felt the need to leave his hometown. And why would he? With the Smoky Mountains on your doorstep, he had everything he wished for in an idyllic living location. He didn't come from a wealthy family, and as a child grew up in a mobile home that had the windows blacked out to prevent sunlight from getting in and getting the place too hot. Once the lights went out at night, the home would be pitch black. He was seven years old and owned, as many kids his age, a Nintendo games console. It was hooked up to a small CRT television set in his bedroom. The television served two purposes. First and foremost, it enabled him to play his video games, but due to it being situated close to his bed, it also served as a convenient nightlight for when he needed to get up in the middle of the night. He always made sure the volume was turned all the way down so the sound of static wouldn't blast him the moment he turned the TV on. The first time he ever experienced anything paranormal, he woke up in the middle of the night needing to go to the bathroom. He leaned over and turned on the TV to give himself a source of light. Once he did so, his eye caught something in his doorway. He always kept his door open at night, and the light from the TV illuminated very little beyond his own room, so whatever was beyond it remained pitch black. This night, however, he was able to make out the shape of a black figure standing in his doorway. It wasn't moving, just stood there, motionless. The way he described it was that it was darker than the darkness of the pitch black hallway outside his room. Terrified of what this thing may be, David lay in his bed, frozen in fear, staring at the doorway. He had no idea how long this visitation lasted. All he remembers is waking up the next morning with his TV still on. He either drifted back off to sleep or passed out. The following night, he woke up needing to use the bathroom and went through his usual routine of reaching over to his TV and switching it on for some light. He got out of bed went to the toilet and then the kitchen to fetch himself a glass of water. After quenching his thirst, he went back to bed. Just as he was about to fall back to sleep, he noticed it again. The tall, darker-than-dark figure standing in his doorway. Fear filled his body yet again. He rolled over to avoid facing the figure, hoping that whatever it was would just leave him be as it did the previous night. Same as before, he drifted off to sleep, waking the next morning with no recollection of how the situation ended. This visitation would occur frequently over the next few nights, until eventually a very strange occurrence brought it to a close. One night, David woke up to go to the bathroom and reached over to his TV, only this time he wasn't able to see anything come out of the screen there was no static or light enabling him to see. He fumbled around in the dark, turning the knobs he could find and accidentally turned the volume, filling the room with a sound of loud static. He managed to quickly turn it back down. In the pitch black, he shuffled his way to the bathroom, feeling along the walls to guide himself. Once he got to the bathroom, he felt around and found the light switch. However, Upon turning it on, he wasn't presented with a bright fluorescent glow he was expecting, but a dull red glow of light shining behind his closed eyelids. To his horror, he came to the realisation that he wasn't able to open his eyes. 
Panic-stricken and blinded, he felt and fumbled his way to his parents' bedroom. Once he got there and asked for help, he came to another horrible realization, which was that he had no control over his mouth functions. He managed to cry out, but his parents dismissed his calls for help, insisting he was having some sort of nightmare and should just go and spend the rest of the night on the couch. Coming to terms with the fact that his parents were too tired and annoyed by the disturbance to care about his situation, he fumbled his way out of their bedroom and to the living room. With such elevated levels of fear, he didn't feel like he would be able to sit there in silence. So he carefully felt around for the TV remote, which he eventually found tucked in the couch. He switched it on and collapsed in the couch listening to whatever happened to be on the TV that late at night. Eventually, he drifted off to sleep. He was awoken the next morning by the sounds of morning cartoons coming from the TV. To his relief, he was able to open his eyes and move his mouth again, but his relief was short-lived when he tried to swing his legs off the couch to get up, and ended up collapsing on the floor. He had lost all sensation and control of his legs. He had to drag himself along the floor to his parents' room, where he banged on the door calling out for their help. David's father, being the cynic he was, wasn't convinced by David's claims, boiling the whole thing down to an act of attention. He then proceeded to pick David up by the top part of his body so his legs dangled above the floor, and then dropped him to see if he would really collapse or use his legs in any way to break his fall. He did this not once, but five times. Each time, David collapsed. At this point, he was convinced that David probably needed to go to the urgent care to get checked out. He spent the day at the hospital getting all kinds of tests done. The doctors couldn't figure out what had happened. As the day went on, however, he was able to gradually regain control of his legs until by the time he got home in the evening, David was able to stand properly, if a little shakily. Later that evening, he went to get into bed. He switched off the TV, and as his eyes gradually adjusted to the darkness, he saw the black figure come into view in the doorway. Exhausted by the events of the past 24 hours, he was reduced to tears by the visitation. When would this end? He thought to himself, as he lay there staring at the figure, tears running down his face. But then, something new happened. Another figure appeared alongside the first one. This one somehow appeared to be lighter than the original one, almost as if it was the antithesis of it. It wasn't glowing, but just as the first figure appeared darker than the blackness, the second one appeared lighter. As soon as the second figure appeared, David felt a sense of calmness take over him. The darker figure eventually disappeared, and David fell asleep. He never saw the figures again, and never experienced any motor muscle function problems either. David grew older and attended a local public school where he formed a number of friendships. His closest was with a boy named Brandon. The two boys did everything together, and upon leaving school, they decided it was time they moved out of their parents' homes and into their own place. They both loved the outdoors and so managed to find a cabin in the mountains where the rent was within their budget. It was small, but considering David had grown up in a mobile home, the size didn't bother him. Brandon took in a dog from the local shelter. After a few months of living there, he started dating a girl named Marie. The couple started to spend most of their nights at her place, so it left David hanging out in the cabin looking after Brandon's dog. David first noticed something wasn't quite right for the place when he was alone in the house and wanting a bit of company would try to get the dog to follow him to his room. The dog would from time to time refuse to enter his bedroom. There was one night in particular when David was alone in the house. He was in his bedroom on his computer. The time alone catching up on games was enjoyable, but eventually he felt the need for some human interaction. He heard the front door open and close, and footsteps walk from there to the kitchen. He felt a sense of excitement that Brandon was finally home. He paused his game and went downstairs to greet him. Once he entered the kitchen, he was shocked to find no one there. He inspected the cabin, 
and discovered it was empty and the front door was locked and dead bolted. Creeped out, he found the dog in Brandon's bedroom and called him to follow him back to his own room. The dog followed, but once he got outside David's bedroom, he stopped in his tracks and began growling at the door. Refusing to spend another minute alone, he physically dragged the dog whining into his bedroom. He closed the door and sat back at his computer for a couple of hours. During this time, the dog sat rigidly facing the door, occasionally letting out a growl at nothing David could see or hear. David got into bed and switched on his TV. The dog remained in the same spot. His computer, being idle, switched to a screensaver. After a while of sitting on the bed watching TV, his attention was drawn back to his computer monitor. His screensaver switched off, and the cursor was moving across the screen by itself. The dog started scratching at the door to be let out. David got up, switched off the computer, picked up the dog, placed it on the bed and tried to sit back down and watch TV. The dog refused to settle down and started growling aggressively at the corner of the room where the TV was. All of a sudden, the TV lost power, plunging the two of them into darkness. At this point, the dog starts barking. David gets off the bed and goes to turn the light on, but before he even gets there, the TV comes back on at full volume. David practically jumped out of his skin and immediately opened his bedroom door to make his exit. Before he could step out, the dog ran past him and out the room with its tail between its legs. David couldn't bring himself to go back in the room, not even to turn the TV off. Instead, he found the breaker switch to his room and switched it off from there. He and the dog spent the rest of the night in Brandon's room. The cabin was a wood construct, and due to its age there were some construction problems. The window in David's room had accordion shutters on the outside that were incredibly stiff to move. David had to use a hammer to close them fully, so for most of the time, they remained shut. One morning, David was in his room on his computer. Brandon and his girlfriend were home and were in the bathroom, as one of them was taking a shower. David had his bedroom door open so he could hear them talking. It was a nice morning, and the dog was sat outside with a few other dogs from the neighbourhood. Their neighbours would often bring their dogs over to hang out in the garden so they could spend time together. Over the sound of the talking in the bathroom, David heard the sound of the front door opening and closing, and footsteps walking towards the outside of his bedroom. He froze, staring out the doorway, expecting to see some intruder who had entered their home. As the footsteps got closer to the point where had there been somebody there, he would now be seeing them outside his room, the realisation dawned on him that there wasn't anyone there. David went through the house to do an inspection and found nothing. There were no signs that anyone had opened the door as it was still locked. He went back to his bedroom and sat at his desk. All of a sudden, one of the accordion shutters slammed open and immediately shut. The noise caused by it was so loud, Brandon came rushing out of the bathroom to inspect what had happened. David, meanwhile, had jumped up from his chair, grabbed his shotgun and ran outside to find no one there. The dogs were napping in the sunlight. If there was someone who had entered the grounds to get up to the cabin, the dogs would have started barking. David inspected the shutter, still stiff as before. The thing had slammed open and shut with what appeared to be no resistance whatsoever. When David got back into the house, he spoke with Brandon and his girlfriend about his experiences. It turned out that they had also been experiencing unexplainable occurrences as well, and that was the reason why they hadn't been spending much time there. David asked the neighbours some history of the cabin and its previous occupants. He discovered that the two previous men who had lived there had died. Eventually, they moved out, and sometime after moving out, David learned the occupant after them also died. This led David to wonder what would have happened had they stayed in the place longer. The third and final story from David took place in his uncle's house. His uncle was a quadriplegic, and David's brother, who was ten years his senior, lived in the house to take care of him. 
With his condition, his uncle had a hospital bed set up in his bedroom where he spent most of his time. There was an intercom set up so he could communicate with David's brother, and there was a high level of security in and around the house to ensure his safety, which included two professionally trained Rottweilers on runner chains in the front and back gardens. The uncle collected antiques, in particular antique dolls. He had hundreds of them surrounding his hospital bed. The other item he owned that is pertinent to this story is an antique Pepsi-branded couch which was bolted to the wall in the living room to prevent it from moving and damaging the floor. David went to stay with his uncle and brother, and the morning after the first night he was there, the brothers were awoken by the sound of their uncle calling out in distress over the intercom. They ran to his room and saw all the dolls were lying flat face down. When they checked out the living room, they found the couch had been ripped from its bolts and turned upside down. The police were called and did an inspection of the property. There was no signs of a break-in, but the strangest thing they discovered was the two dogs on either side of the house had dug themselves into holes, buried their heads, and suffocated. There was no explanation for what had occurred that night. Was David himself haunted by the spirits that visited him in his childhood? Or was he the sort of person who just attracted entities and paranormal occurrences? We can only speculate. We will never truly have all the answers to the paranormal. Are ghosts the presence of a lost soul, or its residual energy leaving an imprint on what we consider a reality? Are they demons posing as lost souls with a more malevolent intention? It is not always the case that what people encounter are simply spirits attached to places, but they can be, in some cases, entities that haunt and follow people. This next story includes the experiences of a young woman who encountered an entity that followed her overseas. Welcome to Deliver Us. The Moors were a family that originated in Canada and moved to Duran, a city located in eastern province, Saudi Arabia. In 2017, they purchased and moved into a new house. There were two daughters, Harriet, the oldest, and Stacy. Harriet would eventually return to Toronto to attend university, but would come back to Saudi Arabia during holidays to spend time with her family. When visiting the new family home, Harriet described a feeling of something off about it. She couldn't quite place her finger on it, but she always felt uncomfortable in the home. In May of 2017, Harriet had had knee surgery due to a soccer injury. So, as she was going to be in a cast and therefore restricted from movement for a few weeks, she arranged it so she could spend this time at the family home. She was forced to spend a lot of time in the house alone, and this was when some odd occurrences started to manifest. It started with objects in the home going missing and turning up in strange, unexplainable places. Then, the family dog would start barking at unoccupied areas of the home as if a stranger had been standing there. Harriet's parents went on a trip to Hong Kong for a couple of weeks, leaving Harriet to house-sit whilst they were away. By this point, she was able to move about the house a little more, but was still unable to actually leave. It might have been the fact that she was feeling more vulnerable being in the house alone, but the presence of something started to manifest into glimpses of a figure standing outside the windows. It would disappear as quickly as it appeared, so it was easy to dismiss it as nothing more than figments of an anxious imagination. It was approaching summer, so Harriet would spend time outside by the pool. Sadly, due to still being in a cast, she was unable to go swimming. One afternoon, she was relaxing outside, when she noticed movement coming from inside the house. The French doors leading out of the garden had floor-length curtains that were moving as if someone was pulling them back. The doors and windows were all closed, so there was no chance of wind being the cause. The only other explanation was the dog, but he had been outside as well. Not being a permanent resident in the house, Harriet would have a temporary bedroom set up in a nook, usually used as an office. 
It was small, but comfortable. It was while sleeping in this room she would first hear the tapping. It sounded like someone was tapping on the outside of the window. Harriet's heart began to race as she lay in bed too afraid to look and see what it could be. Eventually, she built up the courage to open her eyes and turn to look to see what it was. There was nothing by the window. From where she was laying, she couldn't see much beyond what was right up to the house. Getting up and looking would entail two things, a great deal of courage and physical energy to get herself out of bed and across the floor to the window. Eventually she was able to muster up both, get across to the window and looked out at the grounds that surrounded the house. There was nothing there. She went back to bed, but after a short while she heard the tapping again. Without waiting to investigate further, she gathered up her things and migrated to her parents' bedroom. She locked the bedroom door and got into bed. She lay there in silence, trying to distract her mind from what it was conjuring up in her imagination about what could have possibly been making that tapping noise. Eventually, tiredness took over and she drifted off to sleep. Harriet's bedtime routine from this point until her parents returned was to check all the doors and windows were locked and she would shut herself in her parents' bedroom for the night. It was the night after moving bedrooms that the tapping noise followed her. This time, however, it was tapping on the door. This would happen every night, keeping Harriet from getting anything close to a decent night's sleep. The two weeks seemed to take forever to end, but eventually her parents returned, Harriet moved back to her spare room, and the activity seemed to die down. This could have been because Harriet felt a lot less vulnerable now her parents had returned, and this presence had less fear and negative energy to feed off. Harriet was the only believer in the paranormal amongst a family of sceptics. Could this be the reason why only she was a target? Or was all of this in her imagination? Eventually, she recovered from her surgery, and was well enough to return to Toronto and go back to her studies. She didn't return to Duran until the following Christmas break. When she returned, so did the tapping on her bedroom window during the night. After a few nights of tolerating this, she decided to do her own blessing on the room to try to rid it of whatever presence she was sensing. This only seemed to make matters worse. The following night, she was in bed and was once again unable to sleep. She was laying on one side when she noticed something moving in the room. It seemed unclear, but she could make out it was a black figure standing in the corner. She didn't think it was a sleep paralysis episode, as she was still able to move. Terrified, she closed her eyes and slowly rolled over onto her other side, hoping and praying this thing would just leave her alone. Something shifted in the air, causing her to open her eyes again. The side of the bed she was facing now had a nightstand and right next to that, literally feet away from where she was laying, was a face. She described it as having grey skin, black eyes and no hair. She lay there frozen in fear, hoping this was just a dream, that she would wake up in an empty room. Her eyes adjusted to the dark and she could make out a smile on the face. Slowly, it moved closer to her tilting its head from side to side as if inspecting her. It got so close to her face it was almost nose to nose, and then for no apparent reason it quickly moved away and disappeared from her sight. Harriet grabbed a flashlight from her nightstand and shone it around the room. Whatever it was she saw had vanished. A few days and sleepless nights passed. One morning, Harriet and her sister Stacy took a trip to the town to purchase some groceries. Stacy offered to drive so Harriet got in the passenger seat. Once in the car, Harriet caught sight of someone in the window of her parents' bedroom. It was a black figure standing there waving. At first she thought it must have been one of her parents trying to get their attention, only due to the lack of light inside the house, all she could see was a silhouette. What was strange and led her to believe it was something else was the fact that even after she waved back, 
The figure just remained there waving in a slow, almost robotic way. Even when they drove away, it was still there, standing, staring, waving. When they returned from their shopping trip, Harry asked her parents if either of them had waved at them when they drove off earlier. They both denied doing so. There were no other sightings in the house during this visit, and after a few more days, Harriet went back to Toronto to return to her studies. There was a sense of relief that she had left her family home and whatever it was that was haunting her behind. After the flight, she was feeling jet-lagged, and despite trying to fight off the sleep to readjust to the time difference, she took a nap in her dorm room. She was unaware for how long she was asleep for, when she was awoken by a familiar but disturbing sound. The tapping had returned. It was on her window again, but this time she was in a dorm seven floors up. The door to her room had a frosted glass window that prevented anyone from seeing anything clearly in or out. Harriet was able to see the silhouette of a person standing on the outside of the door. She assumed it was just her roommate, Chloe, and managed to get herself back to sleep. The next day she asked Chloe if at any point during the time she was napping, she would have been standing outside her bedroom. Chloe denied having been anywhere near it. This led Harriet to conclude that this entity she had encountered at her family home had attached itself to her. One evening, Harriet was alone in her room practicing her guitar. As far as she knew at the time, there was no strange occurrences. However, the next day, Chloe approached her with a look of suspicious curiosity. She wanted to know who was in Harriet's room with her the previous night. Harriet assured her no one was in there, but Chloe was adamant she heard the sound of a male voice in the room while she was playing her guitar. Some days later, Harriet woke up one morning after what she assumed was a restful and undisturbed night. She went into the bathroom, and when first looking in the mirror, she noticed a bruise on her face. She described it as if the bottom of a glass bottle had been pushed up against it. There was no explanation for it, as there was nothing in or near her bed that could have caused it. She showed it to Chloe, who then also noticed two large scratches on Harriet's arms. This was the most disturbing incident thus far. This thing, whatever it was, was now physically harming her. They started looking into getting the place blessed. This presented them with a number of issues. Firstly, you never know the legitimacy of people who claim to be able to succeed in ridding a residence or a person of entities. A lot of them can be nothing more than scam artists preying on the scared and vulnerable. Secondly, and probably the most important, neither of them could afford paying for such services. For now, they would have to live with it. There was one morning which involved a slight change to the girl's regular routine. Most mornings, Chloe would leave before Harriet as her classes usually started earlier. They had a morning ritual in which Chloe would shout out that she was leaving the apartment and Harriet would respond by shouting back, See ya! This morning, however, Harriet had left for school before Chloe. Unbeknownst to Chloe, she did as she did every day and shouted out to her roommate. She heard the usual see ya response she was expecting, left and thought nothing more of it. That was until shortly afterwards she received a text message from Harriet regarding something about what was happening at school that morning. It dawned on her that whatever had just responded to her in her apartment was not her roommate. This was not the last time this would happen. The entity would at times mimic Harriet's voice and speak to Chloe. Just small responses, but it was disconcerting nevertheless. Another evening, Harriet was alone in her apartment studying in her room. She got distracted by hearing a quiet, melodic sound coming from the living room. She attempted to ignore it, but quickly became aware that what she was hearing was the sound of her guitar having fingers being pressed down on the fretboard. There was no strumming, but she could make out the formation of the fingerwork sounding like a tune she would play to warm up. She called out to see if Chloe was in the living room. She heard no reply. She ventured into the living room to investigate. Her guitar was sitting there idle, and there was no one else in the apartment. 
Other things that started to happen was items would go missing in the apartment and would turn up in random areas. Flags and tapestries that were attached to walls started to fall off. Not in a way in which gravity just took them, more like they were ripped off the wall by an unseen force. One of the things on the wall was a Celtic-style cloth Ouija board hanging on a wall in Harriet's bedroom. It would fall off and end up in the middle of Harriet's bed. One of the last things Harriet disclosed to me was that when she first saw the entity at her family home in Saudi, she did eventually get some sleep and began to dream. She dreamt of an old record player playing an old song in Spanish that she was able to translate to saying something along the lines of If you ever go away from me and push me far away, know that I will always be with you, forever and ever and ever. This story was based on true events and was written, narrated and produced by me, James Deverell. The names of those involved have been changed. Thank you for listening to this podcast. This podcast was made possible by the person who agreed to let me tell their story. It was also made possible by you, my listeners. Without you, I wouldn't feel compelled to find these stories, write and narrate them, and share them with you on this platform. I love telling stories. I truly believe there is great importance for storytelling in our world. It invokes the imagination and opens us up to a greater sense of empathy through shared human experiences. That is the reason I do what I do, and I hope one day to do it a lot more than I am currently able to. So, if you enjoyed it, please go ahead and help it to grow by subscribing on the platform you are listening on and leaving a positive review. To go beyond this episode and get access to the original interview with the person who was featured in this story, go ahead and check out my Patreon account. Patreon contributors donating $5 or more get access to exclusive interviews and a Patreon-only audio feed in which I narrate the original stories I find. Also, go ahead and check me out on Twitter at at Daredeverell and Instagram at James Deverell. Thank you again for listening.